probably going to mess this up. It's, it's weird, <laughs> this new world of... <laughs> on, um, oh, I know. Uh, what number were you, Cynthia? Oh, gosh. I'm going to have to look on my watch. <laughs> yeah. I, know. <laughs> I, I don't even know my number. I always have to look it up. <laughs> yeah, actually, let, me, let me see if I can read it. I'm going to pull up my glasses. But, Cynthia, actually, that would probably be total ejections. You won't have a female ejection number, will you? No, it's just, but, yeah, total. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. I Two years ago, I was at Tailhook with my husband, and I met Andrew Martin. Um, they had a special lunch for ejectees. And he told me only 15 women in the world have ejected. So I'm one of 15, you know, whatever. Linda's one and I'm somewhere in between one That's and 15. It's exclusive club, isn't it, for you both? Um, yeah, it and, is. And, and I love, was it Linda, your story, when um, you first ejected and they offered you a tie and you yeah. thought, uh, yeah. actually, <laughs> it's not really going well, to be relevant to me. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, so they gave me this, they made this little pewter pen and, um, but I really, I have, so I have two sons and I um, actually have been thinking about contacting Martin Baker to send me two ties so I could pass them down to my kids. I don't know if they'll, you know, do that, but that would be great. We'll, we'll chase them for you. For okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks, yeah. Uh, you'd been in the uh, forces for how long before that happened? Um, so probably, well, this was my first tour. Yeah. And um, so I was a Nugget, and I was Naval Flight Officer, a right seater in A6s. And um, I was flying in a squadron out of Key West, Florida. And um, we had flown with another A6 up to Jacksonville. And we were flying, we were doing some uh, training missions against an aircraft carrier. And we were um, pulling off of the aircraft carrier, going to go get fuel and go back up for the afternoon. And then RTB returned to base back to Key West. But as we were um, pulling off the, the boat and joining back up with the other A6, it felt like we had flown through some jet wash and um, kind of like a, that weird zero G feeling. And at, simultaneously, we saw you know a bunch of the master caution lights uh, come on and it was apparent that we had lost one of our hydraulic systems. So um, I radioed and, uh, to um, um, air traffic control after we attempted to stabilize the aircraft and let them know we had an emergency. We, you know, I pulled out the pocket checklist. We started going through all the um, emergency procedures and obvious, you know, it seems like it, it lasts a long time because time kind of slows down, but it probably was within a, a minute where we lost the other hydraulic system and the aircraft started to roll out of control. We were about 270 knots, I think around 15,000 feet. And, um, we had to eject and it was over the over the Atlantic Ocean. It was February. Um, we and we weren't it was like it was a couple degrees warmer than the requirements. So it was like right on the you know, the edge. And so we did not we were not in dry suits. And um, but um, in the A6, uh, in that version of the A6, um, you had to eject yourself at what they didn't have the command eject. So I went first, and then the pilot, Stan Parsons, went um, next. And um, we go through the canopy um, in the A6. And um, I um, passed out briefly, came to in the tug of my parachute, um, heading um, toward the ocean. And so I went through my initial IROC, you know, and do all those initial procedures. Cynthia's laughing because <laughs> it's kind of ingrained in your brain, all these acronyms, you know, that you learn. And so, what height, what height do you think you were when the parachute opened? Um, so I, I, I'm trying to remember the. It's usually like um, a ten thousand five hundred plus or minus fifteen hundred yeah. when you will get an automatic um, seat man separation, and then you'll get your parachute. So um, it probably, you know, when we ejected, it was around fifteen thousand feet, and um, the seat probably, you know, uh, fell a couple hundred. Uh, you know, I don't know the exact altitude, but it probably, you know, was around 11,000 feet. And um, so I released my raft and, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, attached to a lanyard so um, that it's with you when you get into the water, it automatically inflates around, um, I don't know, maybe 10 feet, 20 feet above the water. I reached up to my Coke fittings and to release um, the, uh, the, the canopy, you know, the parachute, you don't want that coming down on top of you and got into the water, got into my raft, and I probably was in the water for about an hour. And um, I, 
first time I had not checked my radio when I pre-flighted and my radio was dead. Oh, so uh, it, unbelievably. So um, about probably about an hour into this, um, I saw a P3 overhead circling and doing figure eights and rocking its wings. So I was very relieved and because I knew that they saw me and um, I started, you know, going through all my equipment. I let out the C, one of the C dye markers, which goes out, um, you know, a couple miles. It's fluorescent green or orange. And uh, then I popped a couple of pencil flares, which, you know, in the daytime, I'm not sure how effective they are, but that's how the helicopter actually saw me. I, um, just a couple um, of years ago, I actually met the pilot of the helicopter, um, Steve Burry, and he said that they were having a hard time finding me. And they called out, um, our call sign was Gulf Delta 110, and they called out Gulf Delta 110, pop your smoke. And I did not hear it on the radio because my radio was dead. But at that moment is when the pencil flare flash came in front of their helicopter. And that's how they found me. So he said, you definitely must have had someone looking out for you that day. Oh, wow. So um, a star swimmer came down and, um, you know, put me in the horse collar and, and, you know, thumbs up, took me up. And um, yeah, that was my story. I, I wasn't uh, too badly injured. I had um, some injuries to my face and my... My uh, hands were banged up a bit, but overall I was in good shape. So I read that that day you happened to not be wearing your, your gloves. Your so, so I had gotten into a bad habit. Some aviators do that. They take off their gloves when they get airborne. And then in the heat of the, you know, of the ejection, the emergency, I did not put my gloves back on. So when I ejected out, my hands, you know, you go through the glass, my hands, every single knuckle got sliced open. Oh. Yeah. Painful. But over, but other than that, I was, you know, I was fine. I haven't ever had any issues and no back issues or anything like that. I was back up flying in a couple of weeks after that. Um, and the nerves as you got into the plane again? You know, I could, all I could see when I climbed back up into the jet the first time afterwards was the yellow and black of the ejection seat, <laughs> you know? And, but I just, you know, you're young and you're like fearless and I just pushed it aside and, and jumped back in and I was, I was fine. But definitely the next emergency that we had a couple months later, I was uh, starting, I hyperventilated a little bit. <laughs> I bet, I bet. Yeah. And, and the, um, it, it, it has produced an amazing story to tell there over the years, is not it? It really has. Yeah, I've told that story so many times. And so it's led to so many amazing things in my life, like meeting amazing people. And it actually led to a book that was published, not specifically about the ejection, but um, my husband had encouraged me to write a book. Um, and I just thought that my story was, was one little piece of many stories. And so... I had a book published in 2012 called Military Fly Moms, and um, it's about um, women in the military, their current or former um, military aviators who are moms, and it just talks about um, their legacy and what they want to pass down to their kids, all about their military career, what it was like to fly in combat, um, balancing family life, and so, but, but the ejections led to a, a lot of really amazing opportunities. Yeah. And also an opportunity to share my story, you know, with, um, with other young women, men and women, um, you know, looking to come into the military and fly. Well, I think it's, a, it's an amazing story. Um, well, thank you for telling us that and yeah. that introduction. Um, yeah, Cynthia, I'd love to hear about your story as well. Another in the top 15 women in the <laughs> It's a club you don't really want to be a part of, right? <laughs> well, it's nice to be alive, isn't it? You know? It is. It, it that's is, yeah. very true, as, as opposed to the alternative. Yeah. Um, so I was a JO also, like Linda, and um, pretty far into my JO career, um, or my first tour, I was a pilot in the EA-6B, and we had a really good deal Friday flight low level, so... Um, two ships going out it was a jail pilot in one ship and one plane jail pilot in another plane and when you go to do a section low you're basically flying around at 500 feet kind of just maneuvering um and simulating a low level ingress and then you know trying to escape bad guys on the ground shooting at you so it's it's really really fun um so it was our good deal and so we took off um we were in western washington and whidbey island and the route is um, in the eastern part of the state and eventually goes into um, Oregon. So we were having a great time flying. And um, at one point, 
we came up over this ridge and the ridge is lined with um, uh, windmills. And we remember, you know, looking down and someone in my jet made a comment about the windmills and, you know, you're kind of, you're low. So you're like, yeah, they're huge. You know, they're right there. And shortly after that, we had come up over the hill. So we were just straight and level. When you come up over a hill, you just maintain straight and level with your, um, with your form partner. And we heard this really um, high pitched whining sound. And it almost sounded like in our jet, when you pump up the auxiliary hides, um, it, at the end, the pump kind of just makes this high pitched whining sound. So we all kind of were like, what was that? So I said, okay, um, you know, I looked down at my gauges and I see the, the right engine fuel flow go shooting up to the top and to the bottom. Now in a prowler, you know, you gotta remember this is like a Vietnam era plane. So it's older than me. Things would happen all the time. I mean, you yeah. would have gauges go, <laughs> you know, oh, you'd have gauges. Yeah. yeah, so it wasn't, it still wasn't alarming at this point. But, you know, anytime you're in a low level situation, you trade that airspeed that you've got. So we we're probably going 450 for altitude. So I pulled back on the stick. And um, in hindsight, they think that that was the last of the hydraulics that I used at that point. So when I pulled up, um, the nose of the jet came up and we started to buffer. Again, I'm thinking this is low level turbulence, you know, which is so common. You, you're not, you're, my mind doesn't go instantly to, oh my gosh, this is a bad situation. Um, so then th we start to get smoke and fumes in the cockpit. And that was kind of the first indication of something's not right. Uh, you know, you would think by now I'm thinking something's not right, yeah. but no, this is a prowler. <laughs> um, so <laughs> when we got the smoke and fumes, I instantly went into my procedures, um, you know, and you, you switch off, a, you turn a switch off. And then um, at this point, the jet had started to, the nose started to come back down and roll to the left. So I look outside and I'm seeing the ground now just getting really big in my um, screen. And when I come back inside, almost all of my fire lights are lit. And when you have fire lights and a secondary indication of a fire, so smoke and fumes, someone's telling you on fire, you see the fire, the only option is to eject. So I did a quick, um, you know, just check of the, the controls trying to write it. And I said, I think I said, I don't have it, eject, eject, eject. Um, you know, and in the prowler, there's four of you. So the backseaters go, one of the backseaters goes instantly. So he went immediately through the canopy. Then the next one goes 0.4 seconds later. And then in the front right, he goes, uh, you know, 0.4 seconds after that. So you're up to 0.8 seconds now. And then I'm last to go as the pilot 1.2 seconds later. And by the time that the jet had, um, you know, by the time I left the jet, they think it was probably, you know, close to maybe 300 feet, 200 feet. And we were in a left bank. It was low, so, really low really low. Um, and we had a couple things going for us at that time. Um, when the jet was actually, when we actually ejected, it was decreasing terrain. So we were increasing clearance from the terrain. Um, and also I'm, I'm pretty small. I mean, I'm only five, 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 four, and I weigh less than Your the ejection. Used to be six foot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did lose it. <laughs> No, but, um, and I'm actually, I was actually under the weight limit for the ejection seat. So I got an extra boost. Um, so I ejected when, when my right seater started to, I see him as soon as I call eject, I see him getting his really good body position. And in my head, I'm thinking that's a good idea, you know, so I get in a good body position. Um, and I go, as soon as my seat starts to fire, I black out. Um, I wake up, I, I wake up before my eyes are open. And what I had done was I had left my hand on the um, throttle. So my left arm was kind of flapping in the wind because I wasn't in a good body position, you know, with my arms tucked in. And I remember thinking in my head, put your arm down, you probably look pretty stupid right now, which, <laughs> you know, I don't know why. But when I opened my eyes, literally right in front of me, the jet crashed. Um, and then I thought to myself, okay, don't land there. And then it was just, um, PLF, which is your parachute landing fall. And I was on the ground. Um, from the time that we heard the first noise to the time that we initiated ejection, they think was about 15 to 20 seconds. But like Linda, it seemed to, to last probably like 
45 seconds a minute, two minutes, you know, we definitely had the time expansion. And um, so when I eject time in the air, then. yeah, we, we only had, it was very, very quick. We, all of these things that were going through my head were happening like lightning quick. And I mean, I just say over and over again, we are so well trained that, um, you know, I didn't even think twice about, you know, I've got smoke and fumes and I've got these indications. I was just going through procedures and then the indicators were there to get out. Um, but yeah, but when I ejected, my helmet blew off. Um, so I kind of smashed my head a little bit when I landed. So I had, I was full of dirt, um, and my parachute only half opened. So again, another, you know, kind of, it is what it is, but I was Andy. fortunate to be light. Yeah. So, um, you have? so you, did you break your arm? I didn't, but, um, going through the canopy sliced all the way through my, um, my, uh, flight suit. So I had a, a scar there. It's, you know, a lot smaller now. And, um, but I was the least injured of my crew. And again, I think my size really helped with that. Um, the backseater who went first broke his back and broke his femur. Um, the second right seater to go broke his nose. He didn't have his oxygen mask on. So his visor came and smacked him on the nose. And then the guy next to me um, probably outweighed me by about a hundred pounds. And he landed right on his tailbone and was, you know, pretty badly hurt. But I broke um, my coccyx in my crash and that's the most painful thing. Oh, <laughs> I was going around with a rubber ring for about two years. <laughs> um, I'm very strange on flights, but uh, yeah, not, not recommended that. So what amazing stories. I've seen a, um, a, a low level ejection runner, Martin Baker, when they were testing it. And what amazed me is just, the speed that comes out and the speed is on the ground, it's literally blinking, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. so quick. Um, and, uh, but the shock it must put you through, you, you sort of, can you, you can still memorize it all or this sort of unconsciousness that, that comes and goes very quickly, do you feel? I feel like I, it's still ingrained in my head. Like it's, it's definitely ingrained in my head every single little, piece part of it you know yeah I don't um I don't share it I think as much as Linda does um I am trying to and people are like keep asking and encouraging me um but I I don't know it, it is definitely ingrained in my head but sometimes I just I just you know try to my husband's still active duty he's not flying anymore but um you know you'll you'll love this because of your your family um I didn't fly for probably two months and my first flight back in the squadron, you know, you have to have certain criteria of who you're allowed to fly with when you haven't flown for so long. So there was a NATOPS instructor in my squadron who was a very good friend of mine and had been my instructor in the RAG and we had actually done that same flight in the RAG. And I said, you're going to be, I'm only flying with you because I had so much, um, you know, just such a good friendship with him. And he actually married my sister-in-law years <laughs> later. So, so he's my brother-in-law and he has a, um, a Bremont. My husband's got a Bremont and actually my um, future brother-in-law who's an Air Force pilot or bombardier, bombardier navigator, he also has a Bremont. So <laughs> it's a I'm family honored. thing. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you all have to come visit us on mass. Yeah. So when my husband bought a, bought me my Bremont, he bought himself one too because you know he has a watch collection so he has to have his own. You know? <laughs> now your boys need them <laughs> well they've already like starting to decide who's going to get all the watches you know yeah, yeah. well it's, it's quite funny because obviously the exclusivity of the mb1 is is known out there and that that poor civilian guy who got ejected by mistake oh <gasps> i saw that i saw <laughs> there's lots of stuff online <laughs> doing it to get his mb1 oh my gosh i know that's yeah. quite a shock isn't it when you sort of reach up and you, you uh, uh. And as a pilot flying it, and the guy just suddenly disappears out the back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're probably thinking, like, what am I in trouble for? I mean, how much trouble am I in right yeah. now, you know? I mean, I don't know about Linda, but that's what, when we landed and we all kind of got together, I was like, did we uh, hit a windmill? You know, did yeah, what did we yeah, do? Yeah. What did we do wrong? And they're like, you just saved our lives. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> yeah. and, but then you have to go through the whole investigation process, too, afterwards. So... There's definitely that um, level of, you know, um, did I do anything wrong or could I have done something different? And, um, you know, and then when you're finally cleared by that, there's a huge sigh of relief that, you know, you, you know, you did everything you were supposed to do. And 
Um, yeah. But well, it is. It's like being a some naughty schoolgirl, isn't it? You sort of expect to be told off because you've done something wrong, and uh, um, and you've just lost millions and millions of dollars, haven't you? In, in a yeah. crash. But I mean, the the main main thing is it's it's you know, walking away from these things, isn't it? Oh, it's I I'm, I think I'm more afraid now. Looking back on it, it's more you know at, at the at the time. You know, like I said earlier, you're young and, and the military trains you so well. Um, but now looking back on, and I wasn't married, I didn't have kids. And, but oh. now, you know, I have a family and, you know, I have, would, have, would have more to lose now at this point. But um, yeah, I think I'm more afraid looking back on the whole situation than I was at the time. There's, there's something with um, good training and being young, isn't it? Yeah. That, that yeah. sort of, I can do anything sort of aspect to, to life when you're that age. Um, yeah. But I think that is, it is amazing training. You don't think about it. You go through the drill, don't you? And uh, um, that, that's, but it's split seconds, isn't it? That's the amazing thing. And if you're, you know, you're close to ground and you're making those fire calls, um, that's just, you, you have no time at all, do you, Cynthia, on that? I mean, it's the same no. start to finish in such a short period. Yeah, I, definitely. And, you know, we were, um, what had eventually come out was the noise, that whining noise we heard was the um, turbine blades of the engine exiting the plane and they were cutting through everything. So even when we heard a noise, we were already way far behind. Um, and we had another jet with us and they kept saying like, didn't you hear us telling you you were on fire? And we're not sure if we didn't hear because we were so inside our own cockpit or if the electrical system had just mm. been cut off to the outside at that point. We only had the ICS within the cockpit, um, but we didn't hear a thing, but they were screaming at us, you know, because the whole back of the plane was on fire. Wow. So. No idea. Yeah, we had no idea. Yeah. Better, better probably. <laughs> well, I, the, yeah. Isn't the... Um... But the Martin Baker of speed, though, just the engineering behind that, isn't it clever? It's yeah. Yeah, it's amazing to think. I mean, we didn't, you know, all of that happened instantaneously. And for all of us to have lived through that, I mean, we, we literally, like I said, they, the engineers were shocked that I lived, um, you know, and they really thought I was very, very lucky. But the fact that all of us lived and, you know, walked away from it is just, it's, it's incredible. I was in the same position uh, that I was um, lighter than the, the weight you're supposed to be. And, um, and so I remember a couple of weeks after the ejection, um, Martin Baker calling me on the phone and walking through um, the whole process. And plus, um, you know, as women, when you are outside of that norm, I don't know if Cynthia had a special torso harness, but I actually had to go to uh, Naval Air Station, China Lake and get hung in a torso they actually make the torso specifically for your body and um so i think i'm sure that was probably part of the you know life-saving uh process too having a special torso harness also yeah um and what do you think uh, this is sort of progressing forward but I've changed subject slightly but what do you think um uh women in in u.s air force now are there enough should there be more what, what's your views on all of that you want to take one, Cynthia? <laughs> got a garbage truck outside. You should start. <laughs> yeah. Well, my opinion is, is if you're qualified, you should, um, you know, be in, in the military now. Women um, can fly pretty much any aircraft. When I first came in, as a matter of fact, when I ejected, I was flying in a support squadron, and the um, I was the combat exclusion law was not repealed until 1993, and my ejection occurred in 1991. Wow. So um, in 1993, I was able to transition to a combat squadron to EA-6Bs, like the, the jet that Cynthia um, flew. And, um, but I think, you know, for women, it, there is a very small percentage. I mean, there, I think there's like 5% yeah. of women in the military in aviation. And for an example, on an aircraft carrier, there's about 5,000 people. Um, when I was on cruise, there were probably about 500 women total. And out of those 500, maybe there were 20 women aviators. And I don't know if that was the same for Cynthia, but um, 
for women to continue in their career, I mean, there's some, you know, tough choices you have to make because you can't work from home. You can't work remote. So when you start having kids, it makes it, you know, the, the difficult decisions of, are you, if you have a, a, a spouse who's dual military, you know, you have to make those decisions. Who's going to stay in? Are you both going to stay in? How are you going to work childcare? You know, are you both going to go on cruise uh, at the same time? And so um, I know in um, putting my book together, Military Fly Moms, that was one of the big issues that, that couples have to address. And, you know, and every, every family has different priorities and they, they make different decisions. And, um, but it is, and I wouldn't say it's more difficult for women, but, you know, traditionally women, um, you know, are the ones that, you know, do stay home more. Um, and, um, uh, but you know, a lot of, I think nowadays people are making it work better than they have in the past. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely think, um, the hard part about females in the military is whether you're good or whether you're you know, not so good at your job or somewhere in between, it's very exaggerated because there's so few, you know, there's plenty of men who are very good in the military and there's plenty of men who aren't very good, but there's not a lot of eyes on them. So it's really hard to feel like you are, you know, either responsible for upholding kind of women in the military, or if you fail, you, you know, look bad for women in the military, whatever it is. Um, when I was flying, I was the only female pilot flying the EA-6B the entire time. Um, we had one instructor who was a female at the RAG pilot, but um, she was, you know, we only lapped for about an, a year, year and a half. So, you know, I, I got my call sign chick because I was the chick pilot, you know, and uh, my husband and I, we had, you know, we had the same last name and I was the chick one, um, you know, and <laughs> some, some of my really good friends took offense to that. And they're like, you're just a pilot, you know? And I'm like, well, I, I don't care, you know? Um, and I think Linda and I, I, I mean, I don't want to speak for Linda, but at least for me, I never was on a mission to be a female, you know, you know, leader or powerhouse or anything like that. I was just there just like the men to do my job the best that I could. Um, but now I love that I have that experience and it was a unique experience. I spend a lot of time, I'm, I'm a high school coach and I run a youth league and I spend a lot of time mentoring women, you know, young women and in, you know, really encouraging them to be leaders and to stand out and having that experience of, you know, being holding your own with all the men is also really, really strong and powerful, you know, to be an example for them. And I, and I love that. And I love that I've had that experience. I, I love I, that you say that. I love, because I know I'm a mom of boys and, um, and I know those experiences for me of being in a squadron full of mostly men um, you know, kind of living your life in a fishbowl a little bit. Um, but it encourages me to um, train my boys up so that they respect women and that what girls and boys can do whatever they want and that there aren't girl jobs or boy jobs that, you know, if you're qualified and if you want to do that. Um, so for me, my experiences in the military, especially in aviation, is to encourage my boys um, uh, not to discriminate against women. Um, and not that they would, but my husband, my husband too. I mean, we both really try to encourage our kids, um, to uplift, you know, other, other kids, both boys and girls, and hopefully they'll, they'll turn into, you know, men that do that also. <laughs> so I think, listen, I think both of you, are you know, to do what you did in that career, especially at that time as well. Um, without trying to be a feminist in any way, shape or form, you were steering a path. And um, you're you amazingly tough individuals to, to be able to do that. And, a, and an amazing example to women that this is potential of what you can achieve. And I think that's a, a huge respect for you both for that. Um, oh, thank you. And, and to go through what you've been through with, you know, with the ejection, everything that comes after that and the trauma and to, uh, um, take that all on board is is um, which is huge. So uh, yeah, well done, both of you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. No, oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Now I've probably I've probably taken up far too much of your time already. Um, is there anything else you would like to add um, at the end of it? I'm I'm excited. I it took a while to convince me to have a Bremont and the watch, the special watch, and everything, and. Um, 
you know, I think it's really cool. And I think one of the reasons my husband got it was, as you mentioned it, you know, it's something we can pass to our children, you know, and um, it's a special part of who, what shaped us, you know what I mean? And so to have that, um, you know, connection, I mean, yeah, it's like one of 15, but also one of 7,500 people who've lived to tell their story and the connection between the two companies is really, really neat. And I'm fascinated by your story with your brother and your father. And I think it just all comes very full circle um, with the Martin Baker connection. It's very interesting. Oh, it's uh, really sweet. No, I think from, from that side, it's, um, it, it is a lovely thing to have. And, and we always say you, when you get a Bremer watch, you, you join the family. And that yeah, is, yeah. if you're ever in the UK or in the States, we'd, we'd love to see you and be part of that. And, and I think you're, you know, having that MB1 watch, five generations down they'll look at it they'll have it in someone's sort of case or on the sh on the uh in their jewelry box and they'll bring it out and say do you realize great yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It tell the story. And, it's also and a great conversation piece too like if i wear it and someone asks me about it um it's also just a great conversation piece you know it's yeah. a great marketing you know it's like advocate marketing at its best you know you're wearing it and and also just to share um, you know, I'm a big proponent of the military and, um, and I always tell people, maybe it won't be your career for 20 years, but I think that it, you know, you could go in and stay in for t four years, two years in certain, certain situations, but, um, the military is such a great opportunity to learn leadership and teamwork. And, uh, it's obviously, you know, you're, you're serving, um, our country and, um, but I just think it's a great, um, just you know, opportunity to share about not only about Bremont, but also about Martin Baker and about the military and also about, you know, um, encouraging people that they could do whatever they want. You know, they can reach for the stars and um, if they, if they work hard um, and they're dedicated that, you know, they can do that too. Oh, I think not Jack, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah let's, well, let's hold that back. Um, no, I think that advocate of anything possible, it's very easy to say yeah. that, but to, actually get people to think that is a different thing and uh, right. no we we are huge advocates of the military and and not you know, the way we see it is it you're not going around killing people you're going around saving people right and right. and and keeping keeping the world a free place and and i think that's you know so, so we've always loved supporting the military and inside of that and i think uh, in america you do it very well this sort of you know first class and military people serving military get on the plane first and all of that. We don't really have that in England so much. Um, but we, we try and wave that, that flag because, uh, you know, we're proud of all, all the things that uh, you guys do. So, um, no, so a big thank you from us for that. Well, thanks for having us on today. We're uh, Cynthia and I both, we've been like, uh, for a couple of years now, we've been uh, trying to get, get a watch. So, uh, <laughs> Well, this is good <laughs> you're, you're and we don't get to see each other <laughs> yeah your members are very exclusive club and we're proud to have you on board and thank you very much and uh yeah we'll, we'll, we'll share the video with you before we we push it out but uh, okay i really appreciate it and uh well i i hope we can meet you in person at some time that would be fabulous okay thank you, All right, Charles, thank you so thank much. You much all the best thanks okay talk soon bye linda bye. okay bye cynthia bye. <laughs>